chiplets, a set of chips on the same substrate, which together act as a processor. Today, this technology is on everyone's lips. AMD is already releasing the third generation of Ryzen's on the chiplet-based architecture called Zen, and Intel is planning to join the party in the next generation of their core processors. But what made chip makers suddenly so interested in chiplets? Is it really a new technology? What pitfalls does this technology bring about? This is MK. Today we're talking about the next step in the history of processors. Let's go. And let's begin with trying to understand what is different between the regular monolithic CPUs and the chiplet ones. In conventional CPUs, absolutely all units such as cores, cache and various controllers are located in one silicon die. In the case of chiplets, such units are distributed across separate dies. For example, in the Ryzen 3000 series and newer, there may be one or two dies with cores under the processor lid, as well as an I.O. die containing PCIe and RAM controllers, and starting with the 7000 series, an integrated graphics too. But why would the manufacturers want to complicate things so much? After all, it is obvious that designing several dies, their power supply wiring and buses for data transfer is not an easy task. Why not just continue to develop monolithic dies as Intel has been doing? The answer here will hardly surprise anyone. At a long distance, chiplets turn out to be more profitable. There are several reasons for this, and the main one is that with each new process node, silicon wafers, which include thousands of ready-made dies, are becoming more expensive. For example, the current 300mm wafers manufactured under the 5nm TSMC process node cost the processor manufacturers $13,000 a piece. The next stage, 3 nanometers, raises the price to 20000 and for 2 nanometer wafers, they predict the price to be over $25,000. It is obvious that under such conditions, the chip makers would want to cut any corners they can find, and chiplets allow them to do this. Firstly, not all units inside a chip require the use of the latest process nodes. In the case of the core dies, there is no choice. The finer the process node, the better, otherwise the chips will be hot and with low performance. But take for example a RAM or PCIe controller. They don't need the expensive 3 nanometer TSMC process node at all, so you can save money by making it a separate chip, which is what AMD did. For example, the Ryzen 7000 processor chips are based on a new 5 nanometer process node, whereas the I.O. chip in them is based on a cheaper 6 nanometer node, which allows the manufacturer to use different suppliers for different parts. For example, according to rumors, TSMC will manufacture the graphics chiplets for the next Intel processors called Meteor Lake. The second benefit of chiplets is that they are smaller than monolithic dies, which means that the defect rate is lower. The thing is that no matter how precise and clean the chip production is, there are still defective dies on the wafer that do not meet the requirements. For example, a core, cache or integrated graphics may not be operational. In the case of monolithic processors, if the defect is not critical, some units may be disabled and the chip is then sold not as, say, a Core i9, but as an i7. We talked about this in more detail in our video about binning. But if the damage to the chip is serious, the entire die is trashed. Therefore, it is much more beneficial to produce smaller chips, since the defective places on the wafer are more or less evenly spaced and the chance of fatal damage in smaller dies is less, which means the yield of usable chips is higher, which reduces the final cost of each. The third plus for chiplets is quite obvious. It's easy to scale. AMD, having a standard 8-core die, can easily get any number of cores from 4 to 16 in desktop CPUs by both playing around with disabling individual cores and being able to throw a whole extra die onto the substrate. Intel, with their older lake, had to develop two completely different monolithic dies. One for baseline and mid-tier processors with up to 6p cores, and a separate one for the top-end CPUs where the limit is 8p cores and 8e cores. This is especially important in the server segment, where AMD can easily scatter as many as 12 dies with 8 cores each onto the substrate, getting a total of 96. Intel is forced to make two different dies with MCC and XCC with the core count of up to 32 and starting from 32, and of course at a huge cost, which affects the final price in a bad way. And finally, let's talk a bit about geometry. Silicon wafers are round, 
but chips rectangular. Therefore, some part of the precious wafer is guaranteed to go to trash. And of course, processor manufacturers would love to reduce the waste as much as possible. And chiplets are here to help. The smaller the die compared to the wafer, the smaller the wasted material zone, which makes the benefit in comparison with large monolithic chips obvious. But since chiplets are so good, why haven't they been used before? In fact, they have, but only in some rare cases when their advantages outweigh the troubles that had to be overcome in order to implement them. A great example is the Pentium 2 from 1995. Yes, quite a surprise. Intel started using chiplets back in the days when AMD was just a kid playing in the sandbox. The Pentium 2 looked more like a video card and had as many as three dies on the PCB. The main processor with compute units, controllers and L1 cache was produced by Intel independently. But the company bought L2 cache chips on the side. In the mid-90s, there was still no cheap way to put them into the same die with the CPU. Later, Intel remembered about the chiplets in the mid-2000s. The legendary 4-core Core 2 quad processors actually had two dies from the dual-core Core 2 Duo in them. This approach really made sense then. The core architecture was breakthrough and cool enough, which made it possible to double the core count in a relatively cheap way. So as you can see, AMD was not the first here. It's just that this time AMD realized that producing large monolithic dies is too expensive, faster than the blue tag giant, and really focused on chiplets. Whereas Intel is planning to get back to this approach only the next year. But Intel is still a company that has all the expertise in the world when it comes to processors. And the older lake architecture with its heterogeneous cores is an excellent proof of that. Intel is planning to return to the chiplet market triumphantly and with a much more progressive approach than that of AMD. The latter simply threw completely separate dies on the PCB, which had to be interconnected by the Infinity Fabric bus. The chips are physically far away from each other, which causes inter-die latency and RAM access time to increase a lot, which had to be mitigated by a large volume of L3 cache. And the latter turned out to be quite a success. Intel decided to go a more complex but technologically advanced way, to use an additional substrate called Interposer. In fact, this is another silicon chip to which all the chiplets are attached from above. Data buses and power wires run inside it, and the Interposer itself is then connected to the PCB. There are two advantages at once. Firstly, all the chiplets are physically closer to each other, which solves the latency issue. Secondly, the use of a silicon chip substrate allows you to more accurately control voltage and data transfer, thereby reducing power consumption. Intel's design turns out to be more flexible in terms of number of chiplets that can be added, of which there can be up to four types in Meteor Lake. The main ones are those with compute units and L1 and L2 cache. Separately, there may be a chiplet with integrated graphics, another with an L3 cache and a PCIe bus, and finally, one with a memory controller and other I.O. buses. This makes it easier and cheaper to manufacture using different process nodes. For example, now Intel's F solutions come with integrated graphics disabled, but physically it is present in the die. With chiplets, the F processors will simply be devoid of the graphics on the physical level. Does it mean that Intel's approach is better? Maybe, but definitely not cheaper. Yes, the Interposer is a much more advanced thing, but creating a two-layer sandwich is obviously more expensive than just putting dies on a PCB as AMD does. In any case, we'll have to wait for the Meteor Lake tests. Then it will become clear whether it makes sense to overpay for Intel's more expensive approach. As we have already understood, the chiplets are the future. But aren't there any possible pitfalls that will surface later? In fact, some already have. The modern Ryzen CPUs have eight powerful and hard cores in tiny dies the size of a fingernail. To dissipate 100 watts of heat from them is far from a trivial task. Previously, it was solved, among other things, by the fact that the cores were located in one large die which included other units that didn't heat up so much. But now the elements that don't heat up as much are put into a separate chip, and as a result, temperatures above 90 degrees on the core chiplets are the reality that we live in. And the problem is that the heat is transferred from the small surface of the die to the heat spreader very reluctantly. And the heating problem is not the only one. Take a look at the dimensions of the current server Epic Genoa. This CPU is the size of a palm, 
because there are already 12 chiplets with cores inside it and another one with various controllers. It's scary to even think about the upcoming Intel LGA7529. As many as 6 M5 Ryzen CPUs will easily fit into this socket. The reasons for the increase in size are quite obvious. It is difficult to make a monolithic die the size of more than 1000 square millimeters. There will be too large a percentage of defects, but you can place as many as you want of those small chiplets onto a substrate. And it is quite possible that this core count race between Intel and AMD will lead to the fact that our desktop PCs will get such huge CPUs as we currently have in the server segment, and inside they will have a dozen chiplets. And this, in turn, will cause a new problem, fitting these monstrosities into the sockets. Fix and bend pins will become routine. There will also be difficulties with cooling. It is very difficult to create a perfectly flat surface on the CPU lid and the cooler of such sizes. But this is a problem for the distant future, and we have to answer but one last question. Why are chiplets not so actively used in GPUs? The RTX 4000 or Intel Arc have a monolithic die and separate memory chips. And even in the RX 7000 series, although chiplets are used, but still with an asterisk. The fact is that chiplets in GPUs have serious problems with reliability and dimensions. Some of you may remember the AMD FedG R9 and Vega series video cards, which had a GPU die and HBM memory stacks on the same substrate. This approach was really innovative at that time and made it possible to greatly reduce the size of the boards. You can remember the teeny tiny Radeon R9 Nano, which with its very compact dimensions and only one fan, performed on par with the top-end GTX 980. But the problems surfaced rather quickly. Firstly, it is poor reliability. When any unit of the combine, be it a memory die or GPU, fails, the entire combine has to be replaced. This is why you can hardly come across any Vega 56 or 64 now, since they're all dead. Obviously, conventional video cards do not have such problems. If one memory chip fails, it can be easily replaced. Secondly, the difficulties with cooling. Since there is no heat spreader, the heights of all dies must be the same. Otherwise, the ones of a slightly lower height will be harder to cool. And finally, the cost. The Vega 7 cost $700 at the start. And this, despite the fact that in games it was slightly slower than the RTX 2080, which was available at the same price, but came with such features as ray tracing and DLSS. Thus, AMD decided to take it easy and went back to using the regular GDDR memory soldered onto the PCB instead of the HBM memory right next to the GPU die. But Team Red still has not completely abandoned the idea of chiplets. Having decided to go the other way in the RX 7000 lineup, they split the GPU into parts. For example, the top end Navy 31 chip has one large die with compute units and L2 cache, and next to it are six smaller dies with L3 and memory controllers. This approach turned out to be quite working. Top end Radeon 7000 series cards are cheaper than the RTX 4000s with the same performance. And taking into account the fact that the number of transistors in the GPU is growing very fast and the size of their dies is close to the limits of production capabilities, it is quite possible that in the ARC 2 or RTX 50, we will also see chiplets in one form or another. So what gives? The divide and rule policy has come to the silicon world. It becomes clear that the future of semiconductors is in the chiplets. Of course, new technologies bring about new problems that were not present in monolithic dies. But still, there are clearly more advantages behind chiplets. So I can say congratulations. We live in a historical era on the threshold of perhaps the most important leap in the development of semiconductors in the last 20 years. That's it. This was MK. I'm not gonna take any longer. My name is Mikhail Krushin. I'll see you again. Bye.